Okay, so in the last video, or the last part of the video, we saw that waves are related to complex numbers, and we care about complex numbers because we're going to be dealing with waves. Well, by the same logic, we need to ask, why should we care about waves? Because generally what we want to be able to do in, in electrical engineering, particularly when we're dealing with analog circuits or working with analog circuits, is we want to be able to mathematically describe signals that vary arbitrarily in time, not like waves. Uh, for example, here's a signal that varies arbitrarily in time right here. Um, the way we describe this signal, if we're going to describe it mathematically in the time domain, is we say, okay, it has value uh, of voltage V1 at some point T1, and so we can represent this instant in time by a delta function. You're probably familiar with that notation. And at some later point in time, let's call it uh, um, time T25, uh, we have essentially the voltage value V25. And, and the way we, we do this is we say the total time domain signal is just the sum of the voltages at each instant in time. And we multiply that by the delta function because we get these little instants in time. And then you really don't see this mathematically that much, but that's, that's how you would represent a wave in the time domain. It turns out that mathematically there's, there's in fact another way to do it as well. Um, and that's to sum up a bunch of waves. That This green signal can be represented by a wave with magnitude m1, frequency omega1 with some arbitrary phase phi1, um, plus a bunch of other waves all the way up to wave 25 with a magnitude, frequency, and phase that's different. Um, and so the way we write this mathematically is we say the time domain signal is a sum of a bunch of waves. And you've seen this in your other classes. We can convert back and forth between time and frequency with the Fourier transform. Um, if you were like me, when we learned about Fourier transforms, my brain shut off because they had a lot of integrals in it. I was afraid of integrals. And so if you didn't really get this idea of the Fourier transform, it's going to be kind of important, and we're going to assume you know it. Um, on this YouTube channel, there are some Fourier transform videos you can watch that describe it a little bit more intuitively. But the main point here is that if we can solve a model of a system, i.e. a set of equations for any wave, a wave, we can solve it for any signal just by summing up the waves. Um, and so let's look at a circuit example, try to say what I mean by that. Here's, here's the uh, circuit's example of a speaker. What you'd see would be some crummy little loudspeaker like that, but the way you might represent this loudspeaker in a very simple way is through a resistor and an inductor in series. Um, that you put some, some signal or some voltage across. Um, that's a schematic diagram representation of a speaker. And the way you would write this typically is you'd say, okay, you've got a, a time varying voltage, which is equal to, through Ohm's law, the current times the resistance, and then you've got this induction times the rate of change of the current, because you learned this in your elementary circuits class. Um, now, Usually the professor gets up and says something like, assume that the current and the voltage are both sinusoidal waves. Um, and, and you always wonder about that, because a sinusoidal wave sounds something like this. And, and that's not music. That's not what you listen to. I would not want to solve an amplifier equation for something that I wouldn't listen to, which would be a sine wave. Um, but if we do make these assumptions, you get a voltage of of time that looks like that, and a current over time that looks like that. And it turns out that, that you can write um, the time derivative of the current um, by that. That's, that's also pretty straightforward. You learned that in calculus. And that means you can rewrite this equation above down in this form right here, um, just by making those substitutions. Um, and this actually gets even simpler, because what you do is you cross out the e to the i omega t and cancel it out of both sides of the equation and suddenly the magic of waves appears in that we've turned the differential equation which is even more frightening than an integral into a algebraic equation and so this is the representation in phasor notation of the circuit where the top equation is represented in the time domain um, so what have we learned from this that by solving for a single wave we turn differential equations into algebra solutions um, by summing up many different types of frequencies through the Fourier transform, um, and the waves have different frequencies, amplitudes, and phases, we can make any signal. Thus, by solving for a single wave, we can solve a differential equation for any signal in a linear system. That linear is important, and we'll come back to that probably later in the course.
Um, so let's review where we are right now. We've seen that waves exist in time and space. In the time domain, a wave might look like this. Here's the time axis. It has a magnitude and a phase component. Um, in the space domain, z, it has a magnitude and a phase component that's written in terms of z with our omega and our k. Um, and we also know that the peak or the period of the wave, the, the, the distance between troughs or peaks, is given by, in the time domain, the period, t, and we see relationships between omega, period, and frequency here. In the spatial domain, uh, we call the distance or one wavelength, and we see the relation between the wave vector k and the wavelength Greek letter lambda right there. Um, let's stop for a moment and see what this wave actually looks like when we combine it in both time and space. So you saw an animation just a little while ago that looked like this. And what we found is that this wave is actually moving. And I can't animate this image, unfortunately, because this computer is, is, is that I'm doing this on is too slow to both capture and play videos. Um, but you can see the speed the wave was traveling is given by most velocities or speeds are by the change in distance over the change in time. Well, we know that in one cycle of the wave, the distance delta z is one wavelength and the time is one period. Um, so simply by substituting lambda in for delta z and t, capital T the period for delta t, you get this equation right here. You can see you can represent the velocity by the wavelength divided by the period, in other words the frequency times the wavelength, or omega divided by k. And this last formulation, omega over k, the radial frequency divided by the wave vector, is how we usually represent how fast a wave travels. One more thing to cover waves is that as waves propagate, they don't always keep their amplitude. As they go through materials, things like, like wet air or uh, cables that have some loss in them due to resistances, some energy is absorbed by the medium, and the amplitude of the wave decreases. So a wave propagating a distance in a, a material that had a low loss, had low absorption, would look like this. Um, this is what the wave might look like as it propagates over distance if you had a medium absorption. And this red case here is of a lot of that energy is being absorbed. So let's look at how we deal with this, what we call attenuation of the wave, or the loss of amplitude of the wave as we go along. It turns out that this looks kind of like an exponential curve, and the slope between any two points on the wave, let's draw that line right there, is essentially the change in magnitude of the wave over some change in distance. And it turns out, kind of interestingly, that that, that slope tends to be proportional to the amplitude of the wave. Um, and so what happens is the amplitude drops a very small amount, let's call it delta m, in the small distance delta z. And, and so we can write an equation like this. It says the change in magnitude is proportional to some arbitrary proportionality constant we're going to call alpha times the magnitude times how far it travels. And then, um, you know, alpha is the slope, and this should actually be an m. m is the amplitude. Um, we come up with an equation that looks like this. We just do a little bit of rearranging. The change in m over the change in z is equal to the negative of the proportionality constant times m, the, the magnitude. And in the magic of calculus, uh, if we let delta be very, very small, we can write this as a differential equation. And it happens to be the simplest differential equation in the world to solve. And it ends up with an equation that looks like this. So w wave attenuation, the loss of amplitude of the wave as it propagates, is given by a term like this. And we'll get into this in the next section in more detail.